it's Lee from ColouringQueen.net and today I thought we would have a coffee crime and colouring and as per usual I have finished my coffee so <laughs> I might have to rename this segment I think seeing every time I show up and I've already drank the coffee it's all over and I keep calling it coffee crime and colouring but you can tell I've had my coffee because I am chatty 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 and wide awake so the picture that I'm colouring today is from Micah Jelena. It's from her Etsy store. And uh, I'll leave a link down below. I was going to colour this for uh, my grey scale colouring uh, colour along in December. But of course I got delayed and uh, we all know what I'm like by now. I'm always delayed. And I was also going to tell this story in December because it's a Christmas based one, but you know, I got delayed. <laughs> I got delayed. So here we are in January, first uh, colour and chat, well, coffee crime and colouring for the year. And I'm already behind. I'm already talking about things in December, <laughs> but we'll see if I can improve as the month progresses. So I hope you had a great start to the new year and that you enjoyed the celebrations if you had any we had a pretty quiet uh new year's we actually didn't do anything but sit in front of the tv we didn't even have a drink or anything we were going to get something but then we just decided oh no we'll just sit in front of the tv and do it some other time it was cold and wet and miserable and raining we had planned to sit by the pool and enjoy a few cocktails but the weather sort of <laughs> put the kibosh on that so instead we just you know chilled and uh, watched telly I think we were watching uh, Spooks actually which is a, a show from the UK which I love UK shows and we watched it years ago we've watched it many times and it's about like MI5 and I love spy stories and things like that. So we're back on watching that one again because I think we've watched all of our series and we keep going over and over. So we're back to the beginning type thing. So we'll have to sign up for Netflix again so we can get some more shows to watch uh, and get another binge series happening. But Hi, this is future Leanne. I realised that I recorded this a while ago and I've probably told you things in my previous video that I uploaded before this one that I was talking about. So I've deleted that and I'm just popping in now to tell you that in case you think that I've totally lost the plot. I haven't. And uh, for all of those people that have been messaging me and uh, emailing me about the state of my poor boob, it has finally turned a corner and it's uh, finally starting to heal up as the doctors had hoped. So thankful for that because it was looking a little bit rough during the week and uh, I was hoping that there would not be another hospital visit on the cards. But thankfully I have now turned the corner and uh, hopefully tomorrow, I'm still seeing the doctor every second day, but hopefully tomorrow they'll, they'll you know, say that I won't have to come in for a week or at least a couple of days that's what I'm hoping for so anyway let's get back to it and future Leanne will now disappear and morph into past Leanne when she recorded this one. Today's crime is is not horrific and uh, there's no blood or anything like that so today's crime it takes place in the UK and uh, we're going back to pre-Christmas in 1991, actually on the 15th of December, and sorry, it's 1992. And we're going to a town called Harpenden, and it's in the county of Hertfordshire in the UK. And it's basically a nice little town, lots of gardens and parks and things to do. And really, it's great because it's within commuting distance of London. So you can go to work and then you come home to your nice little garden and enjoy a sort of country lifestyle and be a city mouse during the day. So it's basically a commuting town and also a very nice town to live in. So everyone on the 15th of December in 1992 is getting ready for Christmas. Stockings are being mounted on the mantelpiece if you've got one and filled with all sorts of goodies. 
houses are being decorated, there's wreaths on the door, the Christmas lights are going up and people are planning their menus and doing their Christmas shopping, Christmas feasts are on the cards, there's going to be hams and goose maybe, turkey, who knows, and people are stocking up on all of those goodies, Christmas cakes, mince pies, maybe making some gingerbread houses, you never know. I love making gingerbread houses, but I do tend to eat a lot of the decorations. And since we've moved to Brisbane, making a gingerbread house is a little bit harder. You have to eat it, uh, you know, basically as soon as, because the humidity tends to make those little gingerbreads go quite soft. But back to Hertfordshire, where the weather is a lot cooler and you can have your gingerbread houses and you can have your candies and your boxes of chocolates and all of those Christmas goodies that we like to indulge in. And I'm making myself hungry there. But, you know, Christmas is not for everyone. And some people are actually very disciplined and they're able to continue exercising and they're thinking about their fitness and not thinking about uh, food and eating and the great big feasts that we tend to have. And they working on their fitness levels and some people even make it their job like Joanna Grenside who worked as a fitness instructor at the Harper's Leisure Centre which I gather was a centre that had classes for aerobics and other fitness classes, cardio, exercise equipment and maybe even squash and things like that. It was pretty popular back in the 90s. So Joanna worked there as a fitness instructor and she was uh, 25 and she actually taught aerobics at the centre. And I remember back in the 90s doing aerobics. I don't know if you guys remember that or maybe you're too young. (laughs) And we used to do aerobics all the time. I even had some leg warmers as well. Google it if you're young. (laughs) We used to put these woolly things on our legs. Can you believe it? But anyway, Joanna was an aerobics instructor. And on Tuesday, the 15th of December, Joanna was due to teach an evening class in aerobics. But it came seven o'clock when her class was due to start and she didn't turn up. And she hadn't called in sick and she hadn't taken leave. She was due to teach this class. And this was very out of the norm for Joanna. She was reliable and uh, attended her work as she should on time. So her employers were getting very concerned. Of course, they first tried calling her, but there was no answer on her landline. And back in 1992, there were no cell or mobile phones so the only way to really contact someone was you know if they were at home and you rang them on their home telephone or if you knew where they were you sort of tracked them down at other places it was good times back then (laughs) so obviously the employers are getting very concerned that she hasn't turned up and she was living on her own I believe so they called the police and reported her missing And the police didn't waste any time. They didn't waste like the 12 hours or 24 hours before they wait for people to turn up. They went on the reliability of Joanna and they immediately attended the centre where she worked and they searched it because often people that are missing are actually in the property where they were meant to be or last seen. Uh, There's been many instances of people being found uh, where they were actually meant to be, but they've been missed in a search. So they arrived and one of the places where they searched was the car park. And in the car park, they quickly find that Joanna's car's there, but no sign of Joanna. She's not inside the car. She's not in the boot. There's no evidence or anything of that would give you cause for alarm outside of the car, except one thing, a rape alarm. Now, back in the 90s, these were like boxes and you pressed it and it made a huge, incredible noise that would alert people that you were in trouble. So finding the rape alarm next to an abandoned car really raised 
immediate red flags with the police and they were obviously concerned that Joanna had been in a situation where she'd got her rape alarm out and had perhaps been unable to use it because there was no reports of anyone hearing this ungodly sound that those alarms used to make. And she'd perhaps, uh, you know, lost the rape alarm or it had dropped out in a struggle and landed by the car. And so from what I read, no one came forward to say that they heard the alarm go off and there were no witnesses that seen anything that gave them the heebie-jeebies. There was nothing unusual about the car park uh, that the police could find. So they immediately sprang into action and based on her reputation as someone really trustworthy, the abandoned car and the rape alarm, it seemed like there was a real cause for concern for Joanna's safety. And so a search was immediately launched. Helicopters were brought in as well as dogs and divers and of course officers on foot. And in total, the police spent about 1,800 hours of police time searching for Joanna, but there was no trace of her or any of her belongings or any sign of her. There was nothing to go on and uh, it was looking like the, the leads were going to get cold on where she is. And they were at a loss how to proceed. They, What to do next? It seems that they had already looked everywhere for her and there was nothing. But luckily they didn't have to wait too long. Two days later, Joanna reappeared. And she turned up at her workplace in a state of dishevelment, uh, dirty, and she told her colleagues that she'd been abducted. And the police were called and they were eager to get started interviewing her and find the person who had taken her so they could be arrested and brought to justice. But it wasn't much of an interview. Joanna was really distressed and... She was unable to provide a lot of detail about her attackers other than to say that she'd been blindfolded throughout her ordeal um, and then she had been sexually assaulted and raped. And she was able to tell police that there were two men and they'd taken her and kept her alone in a house. And it seems that she was alone for considerable periods of time but during that time, she didn't take the blindfold off. She perhaps was too scared to undo it and explore the house and see if she could escape. The interview proceeded for some time, but then it was stopped at the request of a psychologist that the police had brought in. And uh, Joanna wasn't questioned further. So it was stopped on the Friday afternoon and over the weekend... There were no more questions for Joanna at the request of the police psychologist. But while Joanna was resting from the interview, the police didn't stop. They were still working the case over the weekend. And it was during this time that they spent some time consulting police in Australia, in Queensland. And the reason that they did this was that Joanna had lived in Australia for three years and just the year before in Australia, in 1991, there was a case that was very similar to Joanna's case. A woman called Fairly Arrow, yeah, that's made up, who lived in Queensland in 1991, just 10 days, just like Joanna, just 10 days before Christmas, she failed to turn up at work, just like Joanna. And she worked at Jupiter's Casino, which is a casino with lots of entertainment. It's now been renamed. I think it's called The Star. I haven't been there, but I was there back in the time when it was Jupiter's. And that's located on the Gold Coast in Queensland. And fairly worked there as a singer. But she'd complained about being stalked by a fan. He'd apparently broken into her home and left her lingerie and messages on a mirror and had all sorts of different stalking activity and she wasn't being treated very seriously by the police in relation to these stalking claims. And now it was meant to be a fan that was stalking fairly and uh, now she was missing. 
So police in Fairley's case, they commenced a full-scale search and for two days they looked for her and there was just no sign of her. And then after two days, just like Joanna, she was found with her hands tied behind her back on the road. She told police that she'd been abducted, she'd been blindfolded and she'd been tied to a four-poster bed. But she wasn't able to give any other details and she ended up giving multiple media appearances detailing how this was the worst experience of her life. But something didn't feel right and even her friends were asking her if she'd faked the whole thing. Uh, and she denied that. Uh, turns out she did. She was holed up at the town and country motel that a friend had arranged a room for her and he was under the impression that he was helping her to try and get some help or get the police's assistance to check out this obsessed fan that was stalking her and he was pretty shocked when she claimed that she'd been abducted. It had gone from getting some police attention to now an abduction allegation. So went from zero to a hundred. Fairly ended up being charged with making a false complaint and she was fined. And she also had to repay the cost of the search, which back then was about 18,000 Australian dollars. And it was then that the story became that she'd faked the abduction, not in order to draw attention to this crazed fan, but in order to give some publicity to her flagging singing career. She ended up moving to the US and she hosted a wrestling show and then she started a TV production show and of course uh, she was still singing and of course she did the obligatory, uh, you know, nude spreads in the popular men's magazines of the time. But, you know, she's still going and still has a career in America at the moment. Um... The funny thing, though, is that Joanna Grenside actually lived in Queensland, where Fairley Arrow lived, in 1991, when this case took place. And it had a lot of media attention. And the police felt that maybe she got a bit inspired by it. So from the police point of view, they were quick to see that this story of Joanna's didn't add up. There were no signs of a struggle and it appeared that she didn't have any injuries or physical deprivation as would be with someone that had been held and assaulted over a period of time and perhaps the story just really didn't ring true. And it wasn't long afterwards that Joanna cracked and confessed that the abduction was all a hoax. She hadn't been left alone or blindfolded or assaulted at all. She actually hadn't been abducted. It was just a hoax, the whole thing. And rather than being in a house on her own, she was actually at Heathrow Airport for the time that she was missing. And she was quickly charged by police for wasting police resources. And it was estimated that these investigation by the police actually cost over £20,000. So quite a lot of money. And... The sad thing is that police have limited resources, so while they're out looking for someone that is making a false complaint or investigating things that never happened, someone else's case is just sitting there and not getting the attention that it deserves with genuine people that that need genuine police assistance. So it's really sad to see people waste police resources and on search efforts, etc., but anyway, back to jo- Joanna. We, you might feel some sympathy for Joanna. Her case and her motivations are a lot different from Fairly Arrows. So Joanna appeared at St Albans Court and she admitted to the charges against her. But her defence argued that she suffered from bulimia, which is an eating disorder characterised by binge eating and then you would vomit after her. So Christmas for Joanna, looking at the pile of food and people overindulging or just even indulging for someone with an eating disorder, that would be pretty hard for her and she said that it was. There'd be all these Christmas parties and dinners and lunches and all those pre-Christmas events 
And all of that involved a lot of food and it was something that she just couldn't face. And she said that she faked her disappearance because she couldn't stand the feeling of shame and she wanted to remove herself from the family and friends and what is perceived as a fun and celebratory occasion for most people, for Joanna was something that she really dreaded. So the court ordered a conditional discharge for 12 months and she was ordered to pay £100 in court costs. She wasn't ordered to contribute or pay towards the search costs as she was no longer employed and she was on income support and she had really little means to contribute towards such a, a large amount. She started getting treatment with a leading expert in eating disorders and Honestly, I hope that Joanna has managed to overcome her eating disorder and get on with her life. It can be a really horrific thing and uh, back in the 90s it really wasn't getting the amount of attention and people weren't getting the amount of help uh, that is available now. Ask me how I know. I haven't found out anything about what Joanna is doing now but I really hope that she's doing well. So what do you think about the case? Do you think her punishment was appropriate? It seems to me that the court fully believed her defence because they gave her a conditional discharge and she wasn't fined, she wasn't asked to contribute towards the search. It seems to me that the court really took into, into account her eating disorder and the effect that that has as a mental illness on you. So um, I'd be interested to know what you think if she should have been punished more. But at the end of the day, you know, just really hope that she's okay and that she's able to enjoy Christmas now. It is a shame though when searches are taken out for people that haven't gone missing but obviously could have dealt with it in a different way and just removed herself or said she was going on holidays. But I guess we all do silly things in our life. I know I certainly have. <laughs> but she certainly could have done something different. She didn't have to go this path. But in the end, I guess, you know, we wouldn't have anything to talk about if people did the right thing all the time. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed this Coffee, Crime and Colouring. I'd love to hear what you think about the case. And uh, the picture of Micah's, I've finished it up now and... Just added a little bit of white here with Posca and I also did a little bit more shading with my Prismacolors on some areas where uh, I felt that I wasn't getting the colours from the Copics because I only have a very few Copics really. I need hundreds more to complete the set <laughs> so I just did what I did with the Copics and then put the Prismacolors uh, over it. And uh, yeah, that's it from me and I really hope that you have a lovely day today and until next time, stay safe and until next time, stay safe and happy colouring. <laughs>